welcome to our weekly podcast uh, uh, nakul really excited to have you here and really appreciate you taking time over a you know a sunday afternoon so uh, would be great you know uh, maybe you can share a few lines about what you have been doing your journey and uh, then we'll start from there no absolutely no firstly thank you for inviting me uh, sunday is always preferable uh, because uh, weekdays are a little crazy yeah um, but then yeah my my journey has been purely in technology uh, i have done a lot of uh, i mean i've started off as a, a hardcore techie i have uh, changed switched gears and i have moved to a more functional side of the things where i have acted as a product manager i have worked as a, a consultant for cognizant uh, for a while where i was uh, working in their uh, data management teams and you know consulting a lot of uh, clients in um, you know different domains including health including retail including you know food and beverages uh, around how to you know build their own master data data management systems right mm -hmm. so uh, data is something that i'm very close with uh, have have worked with data throughout my career and uh, i think the last 6 years i have spent in uh, development sector uh, i started my journey in development sector with uh, this organization known as everwell health uh, which does a lot of work in health space in tb particularly you now they've obviously expanded uh, but then we used to work on this uh, tool known as nixe uh, i don't know how many of our viewers would have heard of it but uh, nixe is the patient management application for the uh, the tb program of the country and uh, it's one of the largest biggest uh, you know initiative by the government uh, you know with there are very very few technologies very few platforms uh, that have worked across the country which have you know uh, Uh, sort of stitched together public sector as well as private sector and you know the, the journey of both the but the journey of patients across all these sectors on a single application being used in all the states all the districts uh, multiple health workers you know using it uh, has been rare right i mean i'm not going to say mm -hmm. it's only right. one but it's been rare right so i had the privilege to head the product team for uh, nixe uh, we built a lot of uh, Uh, cool things if i may say so uh, for nixe which went live which have been used on field which is still live the tool is still being used and uh, i think around 3 years back i moved to vadwani ai uh, which was a conscious decision because like you said ai is uh, something that's been picking up uh, there's a lot of buzz around it uh, it's become uh, the new technology you know and uh, it's been said that you know after industrial revolution uh, it was in the age of internet and now artificial intelligence is right, such yeah. that the world has taken in terms of you know how things will eventually change and we'll have a new world so badwani ai was something that interested me and i moved to badwani ai around 3 years back uh, there has been a lot of work which i'm sure we'll discuss during a chat but uh, yeah last 3 years at badwani ai has been really exciting got a chance to work with so many different government department got a chance to visit and work with so many different states uh, multiple work happening across health education agriculture urban affairs that we've been taking up interesting journey so far yeah so i was just going through your linkedin nakul and you indeed had a very exciting journey right so from uh, accenture as a programmer then uh, moved to a commercial leadership program then i also see that you have co-founded a company called my sports adda right then heading the product and now completely to the ai so how how does this you know how did this transition happen right it was more organic or uh, or more conscious or more you know Uh, it just you just went with the flow yeah i'm not going to make up a story and make it sound cool but i just went with the flow <laughs> <laughs> the opportunities came my way i took them uh, as simple as that um, mm -hmm. you know the startup that you you just uh, spoke about uh, there was something that we started off when i was in my b school in mumbai and okay. uh, we were at a age and phase where you know there was this entire era about everyone wanting to do a startup uh so we also wanted to try yeah, today that age hasn't gone yet <laughs> yeah yeah no no absolutely of course i mean i think there was at least when when we started that was the you know uh, thing when it started right when there were a lot of interest from vcs right, and right, right. that was the beginning that was, actually that was the beginning right there was a lot of interest and uh, the aggregate model where you you know just pick up a service and try and aggregate it under a platform right, and right, then, you know, yeah. work on your uh, re revenues and gmvs where uh, it was a time when uh, the profit were not so much looked at uh, rather the revenue or the gross value that you were creating were more of interest to you know uh, the, the numbers you know the, the numbers yeah yeah, yeah. the scale that's what uh, that's what I was telling you know with the investor community 
Correct. No, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, we we jumped onto that as well. Uh, we we did it part time along with our uh, uh, MBA. <laughs> no, that wasn't okay. Okay, got it. Got it. So how how did that go? What you know, like uh, what happened to that? And then I see that you moved out, and in 2015, I'm assuming after your MBA, you started with Cognizant as a product owner. Yeah, no, it was a very interesting journey. Actually, uh, we did get a lot of traction. Uh, I feel that we were a little ahead in our time for that particular mm -hmm. business uh, because I now do see a lot of uh, similar business models uh, working in the industry and, you know, uh, doing well, doing fairly well yeah. and using it. I feel that, you know, when we started that, uh, the infrastructure around it wasn't as much ready as we wanted it to be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as compared to a book my show uh, or or compared to, you know, um, Flipkart or other other aggregators, right? Uh, but, but for us, I think... Uh, uh, while we could have done a lot in technology, which we did, uh, everything around it, you know, the people, the usage, the infra around it, the um, the vendors who wanted to be listed on the platform, etc., it was still at a very nascent state because that itself was a growing industry. That itself was not an established industry, right? Uh, paying and playing is a culture uh, that now looks mm -hmm. very uh, uh, organic to all of us, but then it wasn't uh, there back in 2015, 2014, yeah. when, you know, started this off, right? Uh, it was a very new culture, especially begin in Mumbai, where we did all these astroturfs started coming around and people wanting to book those astroturfs and playing football. Then, you know, Delhi started seeing a few of them. Pune, Bangalore started catching on. Uh, and still, it was just football that was doing that. You know, most of these places had these clubs and all, uh, sports clubs and all, where people used to take, you know, longer membership. There was no concept of uh, booking a slot and then just going, paying, playing, you know, that was, it was fairly new. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we did end up having a very interesting journey. We did get a lot of partners on board. We did expand to three different cities. Uh, started off in oh. Mumbai, went to Pune, Bangalore. So it was a good overall experience. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, we ended up with a partnership with uh, Star, uh, where uh, we we worked with them. They wanted us to sort of help them advertise uh, uh, EPL, which was being launched on Hotstar uh, back yeah. then. They, they thought that you know we would be a good platform because we have that reach. So we collaborated with them. But I think uh, because we we where where we sort of started bleeding money was uh, if you remember at that time there was there was a huge focus on uh, um, discounting right and that is yeah. how uh, aggregators used to you know pull uh, their audiences right um, that somehow did not work really well with us because of course we were not funded and we were we were planning to raise funds uh, in fact the way we were spending at least during the initial time was we participated in a, participated in a lot of business school competitions we won a lot of them and the prize money that we got we used it to sort of fund our operations uh, but then once uh, that started to dry up and when the operations increased that money was not enough so all three of us had to take up uh, employment and uh, we used our own salaries to sort of fund this but then yes uh, discounting model did not uh, work for us we were not able to survive it uh, to see the light of the day yeah. and then it was a conscious call uh, to cut short the losses it was a difficult call of course uh, we had invested almost two years to it but then we took a conscious call that you know we got a good deal with star we made some money now uh, let's just uh, get out of this now so uh, these players like huddle and the sorts of huddle these guys were uh, there back then as well no i mean we did not hear of them i think um, Playo had very recently begun its operations uh, when we were in the second year, right? Uh, I don't know when they were founded. I don't know when they started, but we got mm -hmm. to know about them in the second year. And, and we did do a lot of market research. Uh, there were a few players, Atleto and all, which are no longer... Uh, I, I don't know if they're still in operation, but but I don't see them uh, like actively being involved. Uh, there were other players as well who were particularly in Mumbai. I don't think they, they work anymore. I think because we forayed into fitness industry, the only player which has still survived and is doing well is Fraternity, uh, which was which was way before we started. But then uh, we we started competing with them because we started forayed into uh, fitness as well uh, beyond sports. But yeah, there are hardly any players from that time who survived. Mm -hmm. Right. I think I think even sports as a category has recently picked up. You know, after um, these World Cup, Olympics, etc. You know, when uh, there has been a lot more investment from the government side as well, a lot more initiatives and a lot of interest has been, you know, uh, uh, can be seen uh, in the user as well, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so my my understanding, Sukant, is that, you know, um, parents are now more uh, promoting and encouraging children to take up sports, right? Uh, the reason that at least I see in my circle is because 
uh, again, see the 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 goal for parents has always been that you know their the child gets the best opportunity, best employment, best job, or you know get, gets to do well in life. And what they have realized is that the industry has started asking that okay, you've you've been studying, fine, good. What is the additional thing that you are doing now, right? And because the industry has started asking that. now parents want to uh, encourage children to take up sports take up extra co curricular etc right now uh, because of that there's a lot of demand for uh, you know uh, sporting facilities or coaches tutors etc right? and that is what has now created this entire infrastructure where there's a uh, because there's a lot of demand the supply needs to obviously meet it and uh, the government as well thankfully has now uh, been very proactive uh, especially due to a lot of efforts made by you know a lot of initial uh, sports person who instead of not having those facilities have done well have brought that those laurels to india made it made the sport or different sports popular and uh, hence uh, the demand also has started increasing so now you see a lot of these facilities coming up but i i do still feel that there's there's still not enough you know uh, like because you live in gurgaon you want to book a sports facilities comparatively easier for you but now where i live in delhi it's it's not it's not easy right i have to go to a handful of facilities which will not take online booking i have to either be in queues or i need to take like a longer mm-hmm. membership getting membership of these uh, sport uh, sports complex is not very easy uh, it's expensive that, that is in delhi that's, that's a, in delhi yeah it's very expensive you know what's going on in tier 2 and tier 3 cities yeah no, absolutely true 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 so it's very difficult to you know uh, uh, pay and play if you have to uh most of the public parks they have been developed but then you know uh, i see a lot of restrictions now where where children are not allowed to play especially the older children because you know then then the sport become more competitive and you know you end up uh so in in general i think there's still a long way to go for this but i'm really glad that at least the industry is picking up and you know uh the startups who are currently operating in this space are seeing traction because this is very close to me got it got it so how have you seen you know uh, nakul you know uh, you have been you have worked at enterprises like accenture then cognizant right and vadwani which i assume i might be wrong here it's more of a startup or more of you know it's obviously not uh, as structured or not as big as you know enterprises like cognizant or accenture so how do you see that shift and was it easier was it difficult for you to take that move from something like accenture cognizant to vadwani no no absolutely i mean there's a huge shift uh, not even comparable yeah we run we run vadwani as like a startup uh, but there's a huge shift so i i remember uh, i was working uh, uh, for cognizant out of their london office and uh, that is when i decided that I'll, i'll move back to india and i'll start working in development sector okay uh, hmm. again no change of heart <laughs> it was generally i was looking for employment back in india and i came across ever well uh, but uh, when i moved back uh, you know we were working on this product next year and we were planning to launch it so there were a few uh, field visits etc planned right so i started moving around we visited places like darbhanga you know rural side of uh, gujarat etc to do some field research to understand the psyche of users to understand what are they looking for what are the challenges so that we can incorporate all of that and build it in our product and my life changed you know <laughs> from <laughs> working out of you know swanky offices in london with you know thames view etc now uh working across the country you know visiting these tier 3 uh, you know remote villages and uh, being a part of lives uh, looking all of that first hand living them along with you know the users it's it's a very different experience and and i is right. I that there's a lot of lot of opportunities you know not not just for not for profits or social sector even for commercial sector there a lot of opportunities uh, to improve the lives of people right you you make money alongside with it or you don't make money that's a very different and i, and I keep that right, in mind right. there is a horizontal scope of you know how you can make things better yes there is a lot of uh, opportunity to provide products and services at that level uh, which can definitely improve the lives of the people and you know eventually obviously rolls up to the gdp of the country but So yeah, there was a huge difference. I mean, and and not in terms of the kind of work, but the kind of people you interact with. You know, working yeah. with uh, very commercial uh, clients when you are in a service in- industry like Accenture, Cognizant versus working with the government. Of course, it's a very different experience. The setup is very different. The uh, the background of the people you work with. You know, what they bring to the table. How how they sort of interact with each other. The ways of working. It's it's very different. It's a, a drastic shift. Um, from a full fledged company which has you know lakhs of people versus uh, working for a company when i joined uh, everwell uh, i think i might be wrong but i was i think 
15th employee maybe right okay. uh, so from working with such a huge org- organization like cognizant to working with everwell which was a, a very recent startup uh, same for vadwani as well i mean the processes uh, that you know we use uh, the different support functions um, you know you are you when, when they say that at the startup you are expected to do everything you'll be making the biggest business deals and you'll also be sort of you know i don't know uh, sweeping the floors if required right <laughs> yeah and that's true and that's exciting no no i i think that's very exciting it gives you a lot of learning uh is one one of the funny experiences i share with my friend you know uh, you you must have visited all these uh, big offices of this services organization how fancy they are you know they're very structured you have those cards and all yeah. ideas, which says no tailgating etc and uh, we used to work out of this everwell office uh, amazing office very uh, amazing vibe but it was we were working out of a four bedroom apartment okay mm-hmm. and uh, whenever there used to be a guest they used to ring the bell because it was actually an apartment so you know middle of the day you're in a meeting like ting tong and then <laughs> you <laughs> and see who has come right so it was it was uh, you know very uh, uh, very different a uh, lot of hustle but i i genuinely believe brought a lot of value to the actual world yeah and i think i think you know in a startup Uh, the biggest skill as an individual that you need to have is you know how fast you can switch context and still without losing your productivity and efficiency right because context switching i think is a very uh, what do you call it is a very uh, uh, undermined thing you know in the uh, in the industry people really don't understand how important and how uh, critical it is to you know switch context without losing efficiency no But absolutely obviously very few people are able to do yeah no i think it's a very understated skill i think uh, if if let's say i were to have my way i would say that put it on your resume that you are good at context switching because you know you talk about mm-hmm. hard work you talk about perseverance you know you talk about integrity you talk about you know skill sets etc but i think context switching is one of the most uh, uh, challenging skill to build because that is what mentally drains you out right uh, yeah. Yeah. especially when you're working for these startups and you know startups that are trying to grow you're also trying to pivot you don't want to you know lose out on certain things you you want to take up whatever opportunities you get so what what ends up happening is you uh, end up uh, pursuing multiple different directions at the same time right exactly right because you want to hedge your risk right so you oh. end up pursuing all of them uh, and then you suddenly realize that a lot of them don't really overlap there's a lot of very different sort of nature of work that you need to do for each of these uh, uh, threads right so yeah it's it's challenging uh, and i think that is the actual learning that happens uh, a lot of people who have worked out of startup uh, and and you know who have consistently delivered working in these smaller setups i i feel that you know they get a lot of learning and uh, they're also comparatively more motivated because it's it's very uh, <laughs> difficult to dissuade them uh from mm-hmm. achieving something because they are okay they are happy with context switching they are okay to pursue multiple you know threads and keep on hustling and figure out what works what doesn't work uh shelve ideas if they don't work don't get emotionally attached so they they're used to all of this um, right. so yeah it is a very important skill <laughs> so uh before we uh, go deeper why don't you you know tell us little bit about what uh, what uh, vadwani ai does and uh, how uh, how it's you know creating an impact or making an impact in the social arena absolutely yeah so uh, vadwani ai was founded uh, in 2018 and we were fortunate enough that our honorable prime minister narendra modi ji inaugurated the institute uh, it's founded by uh, two american businessmen i mean uh, of indian origin uh, mr ramesh vadwani and mr sunil vadwani so this was their effort this was their uh, contribution uh, to the society because they felt that you know um, mm-hmm. a lot of work outside they've, they've uh, been able to done some very successful businesses but uh, they thought that you know it is time for them to give back they have they've had their other foundations they've had they've been doing a lot of uh, philanthropic work in other domains uh, especially program implementation and in health as well as in uh, education or skill development but uh, even you know what what you spoke about what aditya spoke about even they saw this opportunity that you know we, we keep on talking about ai uh, we keep on saying that you know there's a lot of potential in machine learning artificial intelligence um a lot of big techs are already developing you know products or features or or you know um, entire solutions around it but there's no one who's talking about how to make sure that this gets available to the common man or to yeah. the underserved population of the country right and that is what their uh, goal was that you know how to make it how to build a more application oriented organization 
which i mean it's, it's absolutely fine to do research but can an organization you know pick up whatever is available build on top of it they can also you know build from scratch if required but with the aim that this needs to get deployed right this mm -hmm. needs to go to field it's not something that goes on a particular uh, research paper and and that's about it no yeah yeah How do you connect the efforts uh, various program organizations take on field and a lot of technology that get developed how do you sort of connect both of them and make sure that this technology is actually usable is being used and you see value and you see impact right so mm -hmm. keeping impact as your motivation is what they you know is, is what their sort of goal was uh, and this is this is what organization is all about right uh, work with various different stakeholders uh, government non government as as required right uh, figure out the various challenges and problems that you know they feel that are currently existing on field or you know if you can if you have field experience you draw those experiences from there and think of how can artificial intelligence be leveraged to build some of this uh, and this is what the organization has been doing for last 5 6 years i think the our, our way of operating has been that we uh, partner with a lot of different ministries we have been working with ministry of health okay. ministry of agriculture all these are all these are uh, there is no cost associated to that right all these are uh, what do you call it non profitable initiatives yes so all of them are not for profit initiatives uh, the uh, I mean, the way we we sort of uh, survive is, of course, uh, you know, a lot of money comes in from uh, the brothers themselves. Uh, but we also work with a lot of other donors, including USAID, uh, Gates Foundation, Google, uh, GIZ, you know, uh, SAFE, etc. Right? So a lot of other donors who contribute to this, and that's how we provide these or and build these solutions. Uh, we don't charge the government for any of these. Can you explain, uh, or, or do you mind talking about some of the initiatives or some of the projects that you have undertaken, you know, in India, and the impact that it has created? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, uh, I'll talk about a very recent initiative, which is which has been done in this year, last year itself. Uh, we started working with the government of Gujarat to build a solution around oral reading fluency. Okay, essentially, okay. it helps. Uh, improve the um, speaking abilities uh, conversing abilities for uh, school children classes 3 to 8 okay and we started doing for this for gujarati the way the solution works is a child is supposed to uh, read a paragraph uh, that gets presented to them uh, on the application and uh, based on what they read the ai model that we have built and tries to understand and you know it will give out uh, a result around how well the student has performed it'll, it'll talk about you know how many words they have read per minute uh, it'll talk mm -hmm. about you know where did they falter it'll talk about you know punctuations etc mm -hmm. so it'll, it'll help them you know uh, assess how well they are doing right and uh, we we i think launched this formally i mean we were doing a lot of smaller pilots but i think uh, the big launch happened somewhere around uh, i think a couple of months two to three months back and we have already uh, seen uh, over 1.3 million assessments uh, have already been carried out using the application. This is just in Gujarat. This is just in Gujarat. This is across oh. 20,000 government schools in Gujarat, uh, where 1 million plus uh, students have used, uh, unique students have used this application. Is it uh, an app? Is it a mobile app or something? It's a mobile app. It's a mobile. Got app. it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. So. Now, if you if you look at it, it becomes so easy for students and teachers to you know use this application for assessment, and then take corrective measures. Now, as a next step, what we plan to build because you know through these assessments, we have also been able to collect a lot of data, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can now also build remediation pathway. Right? Mm -hmm. What is stopping the government, uh, you know, to now make it more? Uh, tailor-made learning for individual child because now they know where a particular child exists right and with the advent of uh, all these uh, large language models etc we'll be able to very easily create content as well right, right. now right. i know a particular child uh, is not able to read a particular word or a, or a list of particular words right i know the child uh, sort of struggles with particular uh, you know punctuations etc right now what what can be done is create a very uh, tailor-made paragraph for them to practice and then over time they can take assessment and see how they improve right so all of them all of it becomes very easy right? mm -hmm. otherwise uh, which would have been ideally very difficult to do it from with a single teacher in a class of you know 30 40 students it becomes a little challenging mm -hmm. now even they can practice at home because uh, uh, the application can be made available to the parents as well, right? right so so what was the problem statement that came to you know which led you to building this particular solution there must have something some problem you know that this is the problem statement that the uh, 
that we want to solve, right? And then uh, solutioning came into the picture, and this is what you guys launched. No, in general, I think uh, when we when we started working with the government of Gujarat, uh, mm-hmm. and we started uh, interviewing a lot of teachers, we started interviewing a lot of program people who work on field uh, with these schools, etc. We we met a few uh, head mistresses as well, right? Uh, and what we got to know that you know, in general, students struggle, and they ideally at the level they should be uh, mm-hmm. given a class they currently study in in terms of the reading proficiency they are not there yet right yeah this is this is true for gujarati this is true for english right and uh, this is what actually prompted us that you know how how do we do this right one is of course assessment right one the first step is to even understand that how do you even define where students are faltering where they're not faltering right remediation would obviously be the next step right? yeah, yeah yeah and of course it, it is difficult because i mean students also st- study other subjects as well so and and there are other skill set that they want to build so uh, as a part of uh, you know foundational learning that student need to build uh, this is something that need to be improved right mm-hmm. uh, and this is what sort of uh, you know uh, got us to start thinking about this idea and uh, we discussed this uh, there were other applications that were earlier available but then there were challenges where uh, you know um, they were not really trained on the local dialect because the dialect keeps on changing you know after every few uh, kilometers right uh, there were uh, uh, a lot of applications that because they weren't really working within the government ecosystem were not sharing a lot of data right so they were yeah. sharing participants yeah. and all. but because the data is a gold mine where you can do a lot of other analysis and you know help students they were not giving access to the government for that data uh, that is when you know we worked with them and we thought this is something that can bring in a lot of change you, you just brought in a very interesting, you know, uh, aspect to this, you know, around data governance, because typically if we talk about government, there is a lot of apprehension around uh, how the data is being governed, what are the security measures and how do you uh, ensure, you know, that uh, data privacy, right? So uh, how do you guys typically do that, given that you have access to so much data, right? And uh, this data is directly coming in from those government schools or government organizations. So uh, does this become a, a blocker or does this become any kind of, you know, does this create any kind of challenge for you guys? Yeah, no, of course, government is obviously apprehensive and rightly so, because this is sensitive data, uh-huh. right? Uh, they have all the right to be very protective about it because uh, we, we have seen some data leaks happening, you know, in different parts of the world in the past, mm-hmm. right? Uh, which have caused challenges. So obviously we don't want to be in a situation. So hence government is very uh, secure about this data. Uh, the way the way we work is, of course, see, there are there are certain checks and balances that we are able to put in. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, things like uh, uh, always making sure, one, that there's consent before you collect that data. So the, mm-hmm. the, data, the person who's sharing that data, uh, uh, whether it's a teacher or a government official or the parents, they are well aware and they officially sign it off that, you know, please feel free, go ahead, use this data for this and this purpose. And we make sure that we only use it for that purpose. You know, if tomorrow, we, we, if we want to use it for a different sort of a project, we will need to go back and seek that permission because we have obviously not sorted the first so time. This data lies with you or this data lies with the government? So the way we, we usually tend to function is, uh, you know, government collects a lot of data. So I'll, I'll talk about in general, right? I'll yeah, yeah. From project to project. But the way it will work is the government will lie with the government. Uh, the data yeah. will lie with the government. Uh, and what we request them to then do is one, um, you know, mask all the personally identifiable information. So we yeah. should not be able to sort of, you know, get names and phone numbers and addresses, right? Okay. So mask that, only share the anonymized data with us. Okay, that's one. Um, number two, we will make sure that wherever we are sto- storing that data are agencies that are empaneled by the government. So if you are using some of these cloud vendors, you know, it could be a uh, uh, any of them, AWS, Azure, or GCP, they should be empaneled, right? Mm-hmm. Government is very particular that the data centers should be in India. So we are only using the cloud where the data centers are in India, and yeah. we are not using cloud where they're not, right? Um, there needs to be a very clean concept of who's the data owner within the organization. You know, it, there needs to be a very clean concept of who the data fiduciary outside, right? Uh, and there's a set levels of roles and responsibilities that, you know, we have mapped out internally. We have a very stringent and very elaborate uh, uh, security document that we have to follow uh, when it comes to this data. Uh, who gets access to this data? 
what is the process if you know that data needs to be deleted tomorrow what is the process if someone wants to come back and tell us that you know you collected my data but now i want it deleted right so all yeah. these things, uh, dividing the data into different categories you know basis uh, is it a high risk data is it a medium risk data low risk data and have them different sort of workflows for all of them right so internally we have a very strict sort of protocol that we follow uh, which helps us you know sort of uh, make sure that you we, we minimize the risk of any sort of breach uh, mm -hmm. so this has been this has been something that we have been trying to do uh, you know forever and of course we keep on you know revising this very recently a new act came uh, a draft for you know data protection came so we make sure that we are up to date with all these uh, acts or protocols or guidelines that government releases icmr releases or uh, you know meti releases and make sure that we sort of audit our own systems and make sure that we are following what has been prescribed by the government so it, it takes additional effort uh, it takes uh, a lot of bandwidth for some teams to you know do this but i think this is of utmost importance and this is what we've been following so far. yeah yeah so uh i've been talking to a lot of people you know from the medicine field as well and uh if we talk about ai and data there hasn't been a lot of disruptions around that space uh, primarily from what i understand because of two reasons one is access to those data because it's again become a chicken and egg problem right so you don't have data to train your models. And again, you can't build an effective model until unless you have that data. And it turns out, you know, if we talk about even private hospitals or government institutes, etc., they are super apprehensive of, you know, one, sharing that data, even in, even in the hard copy format, right? Even in the anonymized format. And uh, yeah, so that is one. And second is adoption. So even if you build a solution, right? And until unless you have a very, very strong, stakeholder buy-in it is going to be a nightmare for you to actually drive in that you know product adoption within these organizations mm. what are what are what is your take on that what are your thoughts on that no you have brought in some very interesting points because this is exactly what are the challenges that we face day to day uh, the availability of data is is a problem the quality of available data is another challenge right and uh, see the advantage of working with government um compared to individual stakeholders or hospitals etc is uh, government is able to mobilize some of this data if you're working at ministry level uh it will be able to help us uh it will be able to help the organizations to you know sort of mm -hmm. uh, speak to various entities that work along with the government or under the government to uh, help uh, share that data uh, yeah, yeah. For, for the use because if you're working and if you're you know collaborating with let's say a private entity you only get access to that private entity and the data that it collects it, it might not be able to give you a very diverse view but when you work with government, it gives you opens up access to a lot of these different places. Now, having said that, of course, data quality is a challenge. Of course, availability of data is also a challenge because a lot of uh, hospitals or a lot of uh, you know institutes they don't end up collecting a lot of data. Even if they're collecting data, they might want to you know uh, delete it after a while because of course no, the space is limited as well. A format or a structure that you can actually put in in your model. Yes, yes. Build something. That's the, that's, that's the third point. Point that right? you know it might not be in the format. The fourth point is it might have incomplete values because yeah, yeah. I mean when they were collecting data, they were not aware how it will use, right? They were collecting it for a very different purpose, right? So for their mm -hmm. purpose, it might not have been necessary to maintain that uh, uh, ambiguity or you know the completeness of that data. But uh, uh, for for us to train an AI model, of course, that is required. Now, see the way we recommend this is you will need to put in effort so this is not something that, that you'll go to government they'll give you data and you can build a model in three weeks and you know the product is done there's a lot of work that needs to be done before you actually uh, get that data you might need to build certain systems that help you collect data better right? correct to churn that data and you know having yeah i you know so what what we've done in a few of our projects is we have in fact first established uh traditional software so that uh with with uh, checks and is to collect that data more appropriately yeah, right advantage is because you're working with government and when such systems exist uh the time it takes will not be a lot because you're, you're getting so much data on a daily basis uh you will get that data very easily even if you collect it prospectively but you'll have to put those uh things in place the challenge again that you face there is because now you are you know changing the way uh, people are supposed to work in order to put in that data you will also need to do a lot of training and change management people will not right. be used to working in that particular way or collecting that data it might take them now longer to do a particular transaction as compared to what it was taking them before you right. know I mean, that product adoption you know and if you talk about a hospital which has let's say you know thousands of patients visiting during their opd hours and then you 
change their system and you ask them to you know enter data in a certain format there is obviously going to be a lot of friction even that if that is coming from the ministry or elsewhere right because until unless it's not making their lives easier it's always going to be a lot of you know friction for these guys so no, does this happen with you guys all the time all the time this is a very common uh, thing that we observe on field when we take up a new system or when we you know bring them a new system where they, there's a lot of resistance to change right yeah, yeah. And, uh, obviously you need to deal it through training you need to build more you know uh, intuitive uh, user experiences for them so that they feel that you know in the longer run even if it's if, even if there's a learning curve to start with you have to make them believe in the longer run it'll only you know help you augment uh, yeah. your uh, bandwidth it'll only help you augment the what what you bring to the table right so uh, it's it's a curve, right? So it's it's not as easy as a new product comes in and everyone cannot get excited and start using it, right? You will need to spend a lot of time with your end users to make sure okay. that. Right, right. So, uh, so I think that is the reason, you know. So there have been a lot of uh, work happening around ML, data, AI, you know, in other industries. If you talk about, you know, you have now autonomous vehicles, then. Uh, lot of you know intelligence that is being uh, built around you know using these models even the llm models etc but anything is hardly happening around the medicine industry there has not been you know still the intelligence uh, we haven't been able to put that intelligence in either a diagnosis or the treatment or anything else that is a still very much you know uh, doctor dependent as it so my question is what i am coming to is do you think uh, there is probably, you know, some kind of fear among the doctor fraternity that this is something, you know, that might make their job a little less relevant to what it is right now. Uh, see, in, in general, uh, a lot of healthcare providers might have, you know, a, a, an apprehension around this, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is a new technology. People are not aware how it will work out, how it will not work out. Um, they don't know uh, what what capabilities it'll bring to the table, and will there be a potential loss of job, etc. Right, and this is this is again where uh, Vadwani AI and you know a lot of other organizations working in this field. What what we bring to the table is we educate them that no, this is not going to uh, sort of create loss of jobs. Mm -hmm. All AI will do is augment your bandwidth. It will take away some of the more manual work away from you. Yeah and push you towards doing more smarter work that you're capable of that you've already been doing but then you know you, you spend more time doing that right uh, hence if you look at all the solutions that we developed especially in medicine we make sure there's always a human in the loop right. 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 decision that eventually ends up having an impact on patient without a human intervention right you'll always need to get it validated approved by a doctor what essentially it does is it will save some bandwidth because now there's it's something more efficient. efficient. Yes, it'll be more efficient, and uh, you would have saved a, saved a lot of time, right? So let me give an example. We are working on this solution for a clinical decision system, right? A uh, clinical decision support system where we have created this uh, uh, inter smart interactive form that collects a lot of data and presents it to the doctor, right? And it also tries to do a differential diagnosis basis uh, some of the AI models that we have implemented, right? Now. Rather than patient having to sit with uh, a doctor and then you know giving it all the details about uh, various symptoms and you know family history, and, you know other uh, comorbidities etc. Yeah, all of that gets done through a chatbot. Okay, and when the doctor gets to meet the patient, they see a very structured list of all the data that has been collected. They see a potential differential diagnosis, and now they have all the right to you know change whatever they have to uh, right. make right. a different decision and you know complete the assessment much faster than what they would have already uh, you know otherwise that done uh, but at the same time do a qualitative consultation because you have patient has spent a lot of time in answering a lot of questions mm -hmm. right so otherwise either the doctor would have sort of rushed through it or would have ended up spending a lot of time uh, right. Right. which has now been reduced not at the cost of quality so these are the things that you know we, we need to sort of work with all these stakeholders and explain them that it only helps you augment it. It doesn't take away uh, that requirement or the need because as a human, what you bring to the table, a machine cannot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it will be able to help you and take away some of the uh, manual menial work from your table. Right, right. Interesting. So how do you think, you know, like how do you think uh, 
data is going to you, what does the future of AI looks like in next decade or in the next four or five years? Where do you see it going and how do you, you know, uh, see it? How do you see the adoption going and how do you see the overall, you know, ecosystem? Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, get, getting molded uh, into that direction. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of a lot of the work that currently happens on field will be automated. Uh, AI will bring a, a higher level of efficiencies and productivity in a lot of things that happen on field. Uh, there will be a lot of innovations which will you know bring about things which we have not even thought about probably. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think in in general it'll, it'll help us actually improve the lives of people uh, in in the remotest part of the country, right? Uh, irrespective of who does it, uh, what organization does it, it'll, it'll definitely benefit uh, because with you know so much computing now in place and the cost of computing is also slowly slowly coming down. Uh, it'll, it'll obviously help us build better, more stronger uh, systems. But then uh, I see a lot of lot of applications for AI. Um, I was just reading about uh, uh, you know how what is the future for generative AI, and uh, the interesting concept is uh, rather than you know now trying to build a uh, uh, one large language model to fit all purposes, uh, we should have very industry specific or very job specific large language models. So it has much better context, right? Uh, which which will uh, solve a lot of uh, uh, targeted problems rather than trying to solve everything. Because if you try to solve everything using one particular model, you know, you end up decreasing the efficiency or, you know, the performance of that. But yeah. when you give it a context and when you help, when you sort of put it to target uh, only one particular problem, then uh, obviously uh, the performance of the model increases. So I see a lot of innovations happening. Uh, I see a lot of uh, organization moving towards AI. I see a lot of traditional software organizations moving towards AI. Um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, we are, we are humanity in, is for a surprise in the next decade or so. Uh, what yeah, is right. able to sort of unearth? So uh, Bill Gates recently made a very bold prediction, right? That uh, AI is going to be completely transformative in terms of how we operate and how we, you know, uh, how we uh, basically operate and how we uh, perform our day-to-day -day actions. So uh, we can't even imagine how it's going to transform our lives. And I think we are still seeing that. We are already we are already seeing this, you know, with uh, Chat GPT, which was launched in 2022. So there has been a huge transformation, especially around content, right? So most of the content, content creation, uh, in fact, even image creation is no more, uh, uh, you don't require someone to do that for you. A basic stuff, you can get it done through uh, GPT itself, right? So, uh, uh, so very interesting, you know, there has been a huge debate going on in this topic as, as well. So uh, when we talk about learning in a school, right? So the students, uh, even the students are doing their homework with uh, using chat gpt as a uh, uh, as a help right and uh, do you think this is there could could be a negative impact for this and how do you think we can we should control that right so you 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 use it just to make it efficient but not just for you know uh, just for getting everything done using gpt which is happening you know in uh, even in interviews we have been taking few interviews and we see you know that if the camera is not on People who just chat in the question, you know, type in the question in GPT, and you just get an answer right away. Yeah. Yeah. See, my my personal views are uh, why not? If such an option is available, why not use it? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, all of us were uh, you know used to doing uh, math, math mathematical calculation on paper or mentally, right? But uh, slowly and steadily, calculators have been allowed. Uh, I don't know if they're still allowed in schools or not, but at least in college, we were allowed to use calculators. Yeah, and, right. Exams, right? Uh, and when we had those complicated calculators, uh, right? So if there's a provision uh, that helps uh, simplify some of the work, uh, why not? Why not use it, right? I don't think the usage of calculator has made anyone more stupid, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, people have been now uh, building far more progressive, far more intelligent things as compared to what they were building earlier only because now they are not spending a lot of bandwidth doing something which can easily be done, right? So if, uh, let's say, if I'm able as an interviewer, if I'm interviewing someone, and if the person is using chat GPT, I need to up my game in terms of asking the relevant questions. Yeah. I need to, uh, because, see, there's a reason when I'm, I'm asking something, right? And uh, 
the answer that I expect from the candidate, if they're able to get it on chat GPT, which means when they're doing their job, they will be able to get that done because they have that understanding of how to prompt, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these language models to, you know, uh, ask for certain things which will help them do their jobs better. Right. So I, I don't see any harm in, in doing this. Of course, we need to be very careful about using some of these technologies in terms of our understanding of some of the, uh, you know, flaws mm -hmm. of these technologies or where there's, there are shortcomings for these technologies. Right. Uh, we cannot 100% rely on it. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, so I was I was used, trying to use chat GPT to you know, give me a questionnaire for a particular uh, uh, subject and we were experimenting with something in education and uh, it gave me a questionnaire and I asked it give me some multiple choice questions and I, I found out that a lot of uh, answers or a lot of choices that it gave me, the answer was not in any of those choices, right? Okay, because that's I, weird. <laughs> Yeah, because when I asked to solve that question, it gave me a completely different answer, which was not a part of the original four choices itself, right? So you need to be, you need to understand how to use this technology. You need to understand how to validate, right? Because when you're using all of this, you are the human in loop. And if, if you, as a human in loop, you're not able to, uh, you know, be smart enough on, on the usage, you cannot blame the technology for being uh, stupid or unable to give you what, what you're expecting it to give you. So that is that is something that is is of course uh, I think the onus lies on the humans. That is no reason for us to not use these technologies. I mm -hmm. think that, that creates additional pressure for us to be more smart and you know leverage these technologies and up our own games uh, to what around what we bring to the table. Given that something is now very easily available through ChatGPT, I need to upskill myself and you know uh, bring better skill sets to the table now. Nice, interesting POV. Okay. And and uh, how do you think, you know, uh, so now uh, when you probably used to hire engineers or product managers a couple of years back versus when you hire them now, is there a shift in your perspective or what to look at, uh, what kind of skill sets you used to look at them versus what skill sets you look at, you know, you look at it right now? Uh, to be honest, I think some of the things that still remain is your ability to be logical, your ability uh, to be able to observe things, uh, your ability to be able to uh, crack down a bigger problems and solve it step by step, right? I think all of that still remains the same. Uh, in general, because a lot of people have not worked pri uh, previously in AI product organizations. So that is something that has changed for us because now we want to test them that what do they understand by AI in general? Uh, and when I say yeah. understand, it's not just understanding, you know, uh, what AI does or what it is capable of doing. And, you know, maybe give me a couple of lines about chat GPT, but then when you're building products, how do you uh, measure success? How do you yeah. evaluate AI solution? How do you uh, keep the, uh, you know, how do you evaluate the risk associated with AI and what are you doing to mitigate it? Right. So that, of, that sort of understanding obviously is required, uh, which now we test our product managers for, but I think in general, uh, Everything else for me so far has remained the same. Got it. So uh, I think we are running out of time now. So I have two more questions you know, that I want to uh, talk to you about. Uh, the first one, which I get to hear from, you know, this question comes up from a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of other folks, right? So who have been building stuff. And that is primarily around, you know, like uh, when you are starting a company, right? Most of the company is not too much. It's not all about deep tech, right? It's more around digital transformation or you're building a certain solution or building an app or a website, et cetera, right? So what's the right time for them to start thinking and start building an IP around AI and, uh, AI and data, AI and ML? So you're talking about IP or in general, you're talking about getting AI involved as a part of their I think I think both actually, you know, because uh, a lot of questions also comes around this, you know, like if we see a lot of people are doing it just out of FOMO, that if we don't do it, uh, we won't be able to survive, right? Since everyone is doing AI, we should also do something around AI, right? It's, even if it is just uh, integrating probably a GPT in your uh, customer support, right? So it just gives you automated response. Even if that is there, so you can just write, you know, that you're doing something with AI. No, I totally agree with you. I think uh, I even I've seen there's this... Uh across various organizations that you know you don't need to solve everything using AI. a lot of problems mm -hmm. can be solved by uh very simple non-ai solutions yeah. very simple yeah. analytics, you know and people try to uh just put ai because like you said it, it sounds fancy it sounds cool mm -hmm. you know, uh, 
uh, there's this uh, a FOMO uh, that you know if we don't use AI, we will not be considered as uh, you know advanced tech, right? Yeah. Uh, you should not. I mean, the answer is very simple. I mean, you, sh you should not. You should try to solve a problem. If you can solve without AI, solve without AI. Because a lot of these solutions will then take much lesser compute. Uh, you know, evaluating them would be much simpler. Uh, you might not need to constantly uh, retrain your model and be involved in that uh, uh, entire you know life cycle of uh, retraining your model. Because uh, you don't have to do that for traditional. You know, once you have, if you are able to create those rules to do some certain things, right? And I think the organizations that are working in this space, they, they should beat that temptation. And that is what we do internally as well. You know, um, when we get a new uh, problem statement uh, from, from a partner or from field, we write a use case document. Okay, yeah. The use case document is uh, structured in a way where it talks about, you know, how will you genuinely leverage uh, AI to solve it? What kind of nuances does it come with? Do you have the data available? Uh, is, it, can, is there an alternative that is available to solve it? Mm -hmm solve it without using AI. So there are all these questions that we try to answer, right? And only we feel that, you know, AI is the best way uh, to solve this. That's the only way, there's the only uh, reason for us to go ahead. Otherwise, uh, we, we tend to, you know, solve it using traditional software engineering. We don't really need to put in AI everywhere. Right, not overcomplicate or over engineer just for the sake of it. Yeah, no, because see, I think for a lot of startups, especially in the for-profit sector, it also uh, uh, helps them attract a lot of investor money. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of things, a lot of what they do is just for that, right? So, <laughs> yes, true, true, true. No, no, it, it helps them because a lot of investors are looking for AI products, right? So if they, they feel that if, if something can be solved using AI, um, I mean, see, so something as simple as that, right? If I if I want to build an app to uh, show me a time, what is the time right now? I can use tons of APIs available, right? And I can just pull that time and show it on the app. But if I have to use AI, I will just put a chat GPT. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I say, when you ask ChatGPT what is the time, ChatGPT will tell you what time is, right? Uh, so if I have to have to use it, I will obviously be able to, but I don't think there's a need. Uh, if people feel that you know they don't need AI, but they still want to use AI, I think they should look for some bigger problems. Got it. Great. So uh, coming to my last question, uh, since AI, you know, there is a huge AI wave that is going on at the moment, right? globally actually. So a uh, lot of folks who are still in college or they are just starting out looking for their very first job in the next couple of years. And even folks who have uh, been working as engineers, you know, software engineers, backend, frontend, etc. And they want to get into, uh, they want to become an ML engineer, right? Or they want to get into AI data or ML. Uh, what, what are your, you know, like how do you suggest them to go about it, go about it and uh, pursue uh, something around AI and uh, ML? My general suggestion is, uh, see, a lot of people tend to uh, go after various uh, ed tech courses that are offering various degrees, etc. right? Mostly, 99% uh, of them do that, so. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Uh, I, mean, I mean, feel free to do that. I mean, there are a lot of uh, good courses available out yeah. there. Uh, my suggestion would be don't do it just for the degree. Do it for the actual learning because when you start working, you will need to apply yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You will not be able to just use that degree to get a lot of this done, right? Uh, because the degrees are easily available, uh, you just have to enroll, right? There, there are no competitions, etc. I mean, yeah. not, not degrees per se, but a lot of these certifications, you know, a lot of these uh, certifications no, that no. various tech yeah. firms are providing. And in fact, even some degrees, I know there are some of them have collaborated with certain colleges to, yeah. to yeah. degree as well, right? Uh, because they're easily available, everyone ends up doing it, okay? Which means that there is no uh, advantage that you have over others, right? Uh, you might have a disadvantage if you have not done it because others would have, right? But there's no particular advantage. The only advantage that you bring to the table is when um, you genuinely understand how to apply it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something I think that uh, students and everyone who's, who's wanting to pursue uh, in, in this particular uh, domain, they should keep this in mind uh, when they are looking out for you know what to do, how to sort of enter into this domain. I also very strongly feel uh, we have also made a very big big deal about AI in general. That you know, uh, I, I I have a very uh, that is true. I have a very strong belief that you know one AI is not rocket science. Even rocket science is not rocket science. Okay, <laughs> uh, 
uh, as long as uh, you are willing to put in effort it's not a very difficult field to understand and get into right uh, there are a lot of different avenues within ai as well i mean you, you don't just need to be uh, the one who's building ai right there are a lot of things you can do around ai in terms of product in terms of policy in terms of processes in terms of you know uh, helping with the, the ethical use of ai responsible use of ai there's a lot of lot of opportunities for you to contribute to uh, i think you should just keep your mind open figure out just just you know understand this entire domain and i think then... it's more about implementation now because uh, the days you know where you were actually writing those regression algorithms or classification algorithms those days have gone right you just pull out a library and uh, uh, you just you know push the data to that particular function and you get few results i think the challenge comes in when uh, when you have to uh, what do you call it you have to increase the efficiency by you know even with an incremental number that's where the biggest challenge around ai or ml comes into the picture other than that having basic implementation is still i don't think it's a big deal no true absolutely i totally agree and i think it's also become a little overwhelming because there's so much work that's happening around the world so every every day you wake up you realize something new has come in and now you have to upskill yourself on that uh so you know there is a lot of promo yeah yeah no true 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 that that's that's there but uh, yeah it is an evolving field uh, there is a lot of development that's happening uh, it it does require certain effort that you have to make to you know keep up uh, mm -hmm. if you want to be continuously relevant but yeah. at the same time there are a lot of opportunities uh, there are a lot of different uh, pathways within this domain of ai that you know people can follow Sounds great. I think with this, uh, we'll wrap up uh, today's uh, session, uh, Nakul. And again, thank you so much for taking time and talking more about this. I really appreciate it. And I, I personally uh, enjoyed a lot. So thanks again. No, thank you, Sukhan. Thank you for having me on this chat. Uh, it was genuinely interesting. A good use of Sunday. Thank you. Thank you so much.